Good afternoon and welcome to the Prometheus Awards presentation. I'm William H. Stoddard, president of the Libertarian Futurist Society. The purpose of the Prometheus Awards is to recognize works in the fantastic literary genres, science fiction, fantasy, horror, alternative history, dystopia, and others with pro-liberty themes. The awards have been given every year since 1982. We are now in our fifth decade. Sadly, the 21st century has seen the deaths of many of our award winners. Paul Anderson in 2001, shortly after he received this, the first award for lifetime achievement. And in recent years, Brad Lineweaver, Victor Milan, L. Neil Shulman, J. Neil Shulman, and L. Neil Smith, many of the outstanding names in libertarian science fiction. But this century has also seen the emergence of a new generation of libertarian science fiction writers, including Travis Corcoran, Sarah Hoyt, and Donnie and Ethan Collin, and now Dave Freer. When the Prometheus Awards began, the cultural climate was one of increased support for liberty, for free minds, free markets, and the subordination of government to law. But the United States sees in recurrent outbreaks of unrestrained government power, such as the bipartisan progressivism of the early 20th century, which gave us press censorship, the prohibition of alcohol and other drugs and forced sterilizations among other things, or the New Deal, which created the administrative state and eventually the international oh, oh, espionage and covert operations apparatus. This new century faces another such outbreak when liberty is once again threatened. But we are also seeing increasing resistance to that threat. And this is a time when the Prometheus Award is more urgently needed. The LFS is founded on the idea that culture comes before politics, that we need visions of liberty and authors who can provide them. In giving recognition to such authors, the Prometheus Award supports the continued survival of libertarian science fiction, and we may hope of liberty itself. And now I'd like to introduce Michael Grossberg, who has been with the LFS since its beginning, to introduce this year's Best Novel Award. Michael? Thank you, Bill. The Prometheus Awards, one of the oldest fan-based SF fantasy awards after the Hugos and Nebulas, are unique in recognizing speculative fiction that dramatize the unfortunately perennial conflict between liberty and power. As a journalist and arts critic for nearly five decades now, I can testify to the importance of awards in raising the visibility of valuable and rewarding works that might otherwise be overlooked. And as LFS co-founder, I'm proud of the track record our award has established in recognizing the strong libertarian currents that have always been a visible and influential part of modern science fiction. Since the Prometheus Award for Best Novel was first presented in 1979, 44 novels have won this annual category and a 45th will be recognized today. Among our most recent winners are C.J. Cherry and Jane Fancher's Alliance Rising, Very Long Years the Hook, and last year, Will McCarthy's Rich Man's Sky. When LFS members search for eligible works to nominate for our awards, we don't just seek well-written works of imaginative fiction that dramatize positive libertarian themes about the ethical and practical benefits of freedom in promoting peace, prosperity, progress, innovation, and greater cooperation. We also seek SF and fantasy exploring anti-authoritarian and dystopian themes, especially those underscoring the great evils of tyranny, slavery, war, and genocide, the worst dangers and predictable ex excesses of unlimited government. The historian Max Weber, widely hailed today as the father of sociology, first clearly defined the nature of government roughly a century ago. The state is an especially dangerous institution, ripe for abuse of power, because as Weber explained, it's the only human institution that successfully claims a legitimized monopoly over violence and the use of force within a defined geographical area. This year's slate of best novel finalists represent a wide range of fiction by authors who understand the great harm that the institutionalized coercion of the state can do, as well as the great potential for free men and women to address and resolve the very real challenges of living on this planet in peace. 
For this year's 43rd ceremony, I am very proud to introduce Prometheus winner, Sarah Hoyt, who will present the Best Novel Award. Sarah, who moved from Portugal to the US in the early 1980s and became an American citizen in 1988, has published more than 40 novels of science fiction, fantasy, mystery, historical mystery, historical fantasy, and historical biography. Sarah is most familiar to our members for winning the 2011 Prometheus Best Novel Award for Dark Ship Thieves, a Heinlein-esque romantic space opera with individualist feminist themes and a gripping narrative depicting both a terrible tyranny on Earth and a functioning libertarian society in the asteroids. Her Dark Ship series includes sequels Dark Ship Renegades, A Few Good Men, and Dark Ship Revenge, all which became Best Novel finalists. Showing her talent for fantasy as well as SF, she was the 2002 finalist in the Mythopoeic Awards for her novel Ill Met by Moonlight. And she also won the 2018 Dragon Award for Best Alternate History Novel for Uncharted, co-authored with Kevin Anderson. Sarah, welcome back to the Prometheus Ceremony. It's very good to be back here. Um, before I begin, I should warn any possible spectators that yes, this is my real accent, if you haven't heard me before. In fact, this Prometheus Award ceremony between myself and Dave will probably go down in history as the battle of the accents. I dare any of you to compete with us. Also, I must warn everyone that we might have an impromptu appearance by the very fuzzy Avlock cat or his buddy, the ginger beastie Indy, who has been a pain all day. Since, as Heinlein put it, cats are free citizens, they should be right at home. I can't start to express how strange and happy making it is that I'm presenting the same award that marked the most important point of my career to one of my best writing buddies who has walked with me through all the hard points and celebrated with me all the high points. As well as metaphorically speaking, hit me about the face and head about my lack of foreshadowing. And also way back, explain to me exactly how the book business work. It's okay, I've almost forgiven him. So the Prometheus Award is so named for the Greek Titan who stole the fire of the gods and gave it to the humans. The poor sod paid for it too by having his liver eternally eaten by an eagle. I would say that's a good representation of freedom and self-government as I've ever heard of. Anyway, uh, Cloud Castles by Dave Freer was up against some stiff competition from post-World War II feminist alternate history with a land which evokes the man in the high castle and Handmaid's Tale to brat libertarian a beast cannot feign, which thumbs its nose at us on Amazon in acknowledging his nomination to the Weber-esque Totally Ward, also a high praise, Tra Captain Trader Helpsman Spy. To me, despite all the other worthy entries, the strongest entries were Summer's End and Cloud Castles. But it's hard to be sure that this is personal taste and not the fact that they are both friends of mine, the authors. Though I have friends I don't expect to be in the same room with the Prometheus Award, let alone win it. I haven't had a chance to lock them in the room with my award. Also, I'm not that cruel. Um, and I also have friends whose writing I don't like. However, I do enjoy both Dave Frears and John Vance Trice. Summer's End is a fast moving, fast paced space opera with well worked interstellar trade. I'm an economics geek, so that kind of does it for me and an individual escaping the machinations of those more powerful than he. It's like John was playing my son. Dave Freer's cloud, cast, cloud Castles, meanwhile, starts with a naive academic. I know it's hard to believe, but I was once one. I actually almost majored in philosophy, um, so dodged that bullet. Who wants to better the world without being able to find the real world with two hands and a seeing eye dog? With his mind full of theories, he goes into the unknown and is lucky 
to survive and be forced to fend for himself and actually help others and thereby learn the meaning of true freedom and the meaning of actually helping others, not by education, but by helping them find freedom and survive. I am beyond pleased that Dave's book won, not only because Dave is a friend and not only because I had a considerable amount of money writing on the fact that given the chance, libertarians would vote for the guy who has once cuddled charts for science, but, because I think it is very a very important book for our times. When freedom is threatened on all sides and most people are either looking for the proverbial savior on a white horse or a dark limo or to some theory of how things should work to save them, it is important to remind one and all, in the end, the only one who can save you is you. And you owe it to yourself and all those you love and really to the future of humanity to come to your own rescue and not let the innocent and clueless or simply less able be destroyed by pitiless aliens and the systems that abet them. And no, I'm not talking about UFOs. I, I'm talking about people who are more beholden to systems than to people as they actually are in aren't willing to concede to others the right self-determination. Despite the fact that reading it taught me all new language, and despite or perhaps because it's a rip-roaring yarn, I think Cloud Castles deserves a place in the literature of freedom, because being free is hard yakka, and yet we must do it because this is the only hope for the future. Congratulations, Dave. Thank you very much, Sarah. G'day, g'day all. Firstly, I'd like to apologize for my accent. I, I come from a polyglot of origins and as real Australians would actually yell, you're a bloody mongrel, you drongo. And that's a pretty accurate description of me because it allows for the hybrid vigor and no pretensions of grandeur or any delusions of good behavior. I do feel very like that scruffy mongrel who's slipped the leash, stolen a slab of bacon and a string of sausages from a butcher's shop, and then run hotly pursued by shouts and chaos in his wake into the middle of crafts and leapt up onto the winner's podium, panting and grinning to enjoy my ill-gotten gains, while you judges and former winners look on with absolute horror. I have to do these small things for you. Here I am, a Tasmanian, from a little remote island on the end of Australia, looking at that list of honorees. It's a pretty grand list. And I'm wondering, what the hell am I doing among all this lot of thoroughbreds? You know, I take some comfort from the fact that this is the Prometheus Award. Prometheus himself was a stroppy bastard who stole fire from the gods to give it to mankind, rebelled against the authority and autocracy of Olympus. Suits me. If you know anything about Australia, you'll know that Tasmania, or as it was called, Van Diemen's Land, is where the British transport the worst of irredeemable rebels to live and from the British Empire's point of view, hopefully die in de facto slavery. If there's one corner of Australia that ought to be a natural place for anti-authoritarian rebels, it's there. I started my writing career about the maximum sentence ago um, admittedly voluntarily, but if I'd actually known what I was in for, I think they'd have probably had to transport me. And a rebel I came, and after 25 books, I'm still the same. I gather that I'm the first Australian to ever be honoured with this award. Well, this award really is about promoting liberty. I hope that I can persuade all of you that liberty should not be confined 
It should not become insular. And those people who've had it restricted, and Sarah had her own experiences of this, and I've had my experiences of this, and COVID has provided us with a whole new layer of experiences of this. Um, we know what it means. We can become the fiercest partisans of li liberty. We know the alternatives. So I was told that I was needed to give a speech and that thank you very much would be a little inadequate. Oof. Look, it was good enough for Bilbo Baggins. Surely it's good enough for me. I'm about the same height and I've got hairy feet. You know, what else do you want? But anyway, I set about looking at what I should do. And I sat down to look at the videos of previous um, Prometheus Awards. And I got a little bit into William Stoddard's fine introductory speech for the 20, 2022 award. And I discovered that Prometheus Awards strive to build a freer universe. This looked me, left me looking at that screen like an absolute stunned mullet. Listen, trust me, nobody in their right mind wants to live in a freer universe. That place is only good for hunting snarks and is entirely filled with chasms and crags and sharks and other things like that. Besides that, you should all have your own universes. Yeah, okay. So I'm the guy who always makes bad jokes when dealing with serious things. I've been around some more of my fair share of deadly serious things. Wrestling sharks, yes, that's true. Um, I've been alongside some of the finest people that the human race has ever thrown up. Uh, my experience in the medical corps with mountain rescue and now with volunteer ambulance. The kind of jokes that get told would have the modern morality police having absolute kitten fits. Yet often the tellers have been giving literally everything they have to give. They've been risking their own lives, sometimes for days, for people that they don't even know. They don't always succeed. And dealing with it, often the worst sort of outcomes, the only way you really can cope is humor. It's a coping mechanism. And we all need it because we are actually in a deadly David and Goliath war with the authoritarian forces who would like to crush us crush freedom of speech, crush freedom of thought, crush freedom of any kind under their heels. They want us in bondage. And then they'll take our liberty from us by any means possible. They're very good at finding reasons, which they always justify as being for your own good. Fortunately, humor, is something which is alien to them. And it's not only a way to cope, it's also a way to fight back. My own credo on the foundations of human liberty is that it rests on the freedom of thought. If your ideas can be constrained and prescribed or better still, from the authoritarian point of view, just never exist at all in the minds of those they subjugate. They win. It's not what a book makes you think about. It's that it makes you think at all. That it makes you question, even disagree. It makes you, makes the book the enemy of authoritarianism. And you know, if spreading that kind of fire to mankind is your idea of what should be done, and it's always been mine, 
Well, you've got a lot more chance of catching flies with honey than vinegar. An entertaining story which makes people laugh or makes people smile even has a lot more chance than a sermon which bores them, even if they agree with it. I like to give people the chance to have those ideas. Just to question the logic of things which are always accepted. You know, I like people to question established wisdom because there's far less wisdom than most people actually realize. Like truth, it's mostly diluted with BS and tall stories. Oh. Tall stories, yeah, tall stories. Well, that leads me into Cloud Castles. This book was born out of a libertarian to outright anarchist concept that the best single defense of liberty is the ability to leave any form of bondage easily. Autocracies tend to have barriers to keep people in. The freer a society, the less they care if you leave. In fact, if anything, they have to try and keep themselves from being swamped by people who want in. So I have this theory that geographical and physical conditions shape societies. Societies which face regular periods of extreme hardship, say heavy snow every winter, or regular dry periods, they have to prepare for those. Or they die. Everybody in them dies. Anyone who doesn't do that dies. It becomes an ingrained part of a society, maybe even of their genome. On the other hand, if you take crowded, dense living conditions, they shape wider, they shape very different societies to wide open ones. It's harder, not impossible, but harder for liberty to thrive under high density conditions, which is of course why the authoritarians would always push for those. They want you crowded into your little cities. They want you totally dependent on public transport and they want you obedient to their rules. Because I'm a new Australian and I'm intensely proud of the heritage of the country that offered me a home refuge. I use something which is very much part of the history of Australia for my book, which is the settlement by convict transportees. My human colonists in the story are themselves transportees from an Australia of the future, crash landed onto a tiny little landing point on a world with no habitable land, onto an alien relic, a few square miles of anti-gravity plate that once was the meeting place and trading station of two inimical alien cultures. You see, Cloud Castles was set on a gas dwarf world in the habitable zone of the upper atmosphere, not just because as a biologist, I found the idea of living there absolutely fascinating, but because it offered the ultimate libertarian environment, one in which bondage was really, really difficult once you got out among the floating vegetation of the outback. Both the sheer size and the ease of movement made captivity, physical or even financial, very difficult. So that was the basis for my story. At the opposite extreme, set in this huge vastness of space, was the anti-gravity plate, or the big SID, which had reached what I consider the end point of all autocracies where the thugs and the, the authority of the autocratic alien overlords have absolute power over life and death. The big Sid is, as I believe all crowded autocracies become, a rapacious, corrupt, Dickensian hellhole, producing little and essentially parasitic on the vast outback. 
they look down on as barbaric and inferior. This book is all about the contrast between these. Because I've never written a single layer of a book in my life, into this political geography, I introduced a Candide-like character, the idealistic do-gooder, the scion of a young, the young scion of a wealthy engineering family, blinkered into the idea that there's nothing bad in the poor oppressed people. He has this idea that poverty equals goodness, not that goodness actually springs from the individual. He gets an education in that and discovers that people are people and not defined by their superficialities. At the same time, I was working on something that I've been blindsided by. Each side in any debate always expects the other people to think and indeed act like themselves. Our heroes, something of a naive drongo, but a nasty thought would never have entered his head without a pattering rat. Sorry, William. Okay. Um, those he's dealing with in the big Sid never had any other kind of thoughts. I created a comedy of errors and I hope a learning curve for my readers. The characters do finally escape this hellhole. And our hero and his sidekick had their first taste of actual slavery. Before escaping this and setting out to really uplift the world through engineering. Yeah, this is a return to the heroic engineer. And the return of commerce, so much beloved of Paul Anderson's books. Our Candide hero finds people whose mindset is not alien to his, and with his big sidekick, sets out to make a better society through trade, free association, and technological development. The book is, I hope, into the bargain, funny, full of terrible puns, and plays on the misunderstandings of the Australian vernacular, and with deeds of somewhat involuntary daring do, and even maybe a touch of romance. Well, sometimes it sneaks in. And that's my book, Cloud Castles. I'm delighted to win the Prometheus with it. That I'm here at all is because I stood on the shoulders of giants to get here. There's a lot of truth in the mongrel simile because I took a great deal from authors I revere. Authors, oddly, who are very well re represented in the Prometheus. It got churned up with a misspent youth. Never was anyone who took Heinlein's specialization as for ants more to heart. And at least it meant that I knew exactly how stupid my characters would be. Well, finally, as English is something like my fifth language and my in infant synapses got it very confused, I'm allowed to be confused about the accepted way of doing things. It's the norm in speeches to thank everybody first. I'd rather leave you with my thanks. As I've talked for far too long, and you've probably managed to forget the first bit. As always, I owe most of my thanks, my greatest thanks, to my dearest wife, who's always believed in my writing and put up with very occasionally being called by my current heroine's name. For this book, my thanks, my deepest thanks, go to the bureaucrats whose illogical and petty conduct and casual abuse of power furnished me with such fine villains. They inspired me to write a story in which we can live beyond them. On the opposite hand, my thanks go to trainers and my fellow ambulance volunteers who provided me both with the sort of models of heroes that we all need, and quite a lot of the drama. Specifically, I'd like to name Dr. Alex John and my good friend, Dr. Mark Baldwin, who stopped me from making too many ridiculous medical errors. Along the way, I had many cheerleaders for this book, and 
many publishers who turned the proposal down. This is my 25th book. Um, I thank both parties. One side who helped me up and the other side for stimulating my obstinacy and pushing me into finally publishing it myself. The Prometheus seems a fit tribute to this. There's nothing more libertarian than the response to the central figures of authority in your sphere saying to you, you can't do that, and saying, try and stop me, I bloody well will. It's knocked me down a few times, but nothing earns more respect in the traditional Australian culture than the battler who gets knocked down and gets up and tries again and gets knocked down and tries again. Well, I've been knocked down a fair bit and all our, and all, our all being battlers is something that freedom really needs. And now in that final Baggin style, thank you all very much. My first readers, the people who've helped me along the way and especially the Libertarian Futurist Society who organized this and who voted to make me this year's winner. I am honored and delighted. Thank you all. Thank you, Dave. And I want, I want to take off from one of your remarks. You brought up David and Goliath, and you made me think of my favorite pieces of sculpture. It's one of several Italian sculptures of David, not the one by Michelangelo that everybody knows, or the very pretty one by Donatello, but the one by Bernini, which shows David as a young but adult man standing tensed, ready to let fly with a sling stone and with a look in his eyes that says, now I've got you, you son of a bitch. There is a proper libertarian spirit for you. Now I would like to present this year's Hall of Fame Award, which rather fits that same theme. Unlike the Best Novel Award, the Hall of Fame can be given to works in any narrative or dramatic form, short fiction, narrative verse, plays, movies, television and video episodes or series, graphic novels, songs, and so on. It's restricted to works that have first appeared at least 20 years ago. A great many of our award winners are older than that, often dating to before the LFS was founded. Our first two awards went to Alice Shrugged, one of the major inspirations for the emergence of libertarianism, and to The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, the foundational work of libertarian science fiction, what TV tropes would call the trope codifier. 20 years after publication, we're past any initial wave of enthusiasm for a new work. The award goes to works that we are still reading, viewing, or listening to, despite the passage of time. In some cases, at least, to works whose merit has become more visible with time. This year, once again, we come back to Robert Heinlein for the Hall of Fame Award for his novelette, Free Men, a very American story, but also a timeless story of resistance to tyranny imposed from without by enemy armies. Here to accept the award are Art Dula, primary trustee for the Heinlein Prize Trust, followed by John Tilden, chairman of the Heinlein Society. Art? Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Society on behalf of the uh, Heinlein Literary Estate for the Prometheus Award, which I've received. I have it on my desk. And thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to make some remarks uh, and then read from a letter that I found in the archives. Uh, it was written in 1947 by Mr. Heinlein. Uh, Heinlein was born uh, on uh, the seventh day of the seventh month of the seventh year of the last century. So if the number of the beast is 666, the number of Heinlein is 777. And he died 80 years later. And during that time, he invented the waterbed and wrote a lot of interesting stories. And on his 100th birthday, uh, the Heinlein Trust released the digital archives that are all the archives that are at the special collection at the University of California, Santa Cruz. There are tens of thousands of Heinlein documents in this archive, 
and we're now re-releasing it so it can be more public. One of the documents is the letter that I'm going to read from that was written between February 27th and April 1st of 1947, when Heinlein was uh, about 39, 40 years old. He'd been writing short stories and he had not yet published his first novel. Anyone who buys the complete works of Robert Heinlein, and we sell it, uh, 46 volumes in leather, and we've sold about 1,200 sets, I have about a few hundred left, uh, gets free access for their whole life to the archives. And I can only tell you that it's full of amazing things. Uh, I will only suggest that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Heinlein were both avid naturalists, and Robert was an enthusiastic amateur photographer. If that doesn't get you interested in finding out what's in the archives, nothing will. Uh, but this is a letter that was written at the beginning of his writing career. And there's just two or three things I want to say before I read from it. One is that we published the Virginia edition. So the entire works of Heinlein are now available and they'll never be lost because they've been digitized and they're not going to be lost. But perhaps you didn't know that the first collected works of all of Heinlein's novels was published not in English, but in Russian. Because the Russian people loved the idea of freedom and they loved Heinlein and the Soviet state tried to suppress it and it was published anyway. And we now have a publisher in Russia and all of his works are available in Russian. This past year, we signed a contract with the largest publisher in China to publish all of Heinlein's work in China. Now, the United States is only 4% of the world's population and only about 15 to 20% of the world can be considered free even under the most liberal definition of that word. The other 80% live in authoritarian tyranny. And I think that we're infecting that tyranny with Heinlein's ideas. So let me go back to the letter. It's five pages long. It's typed. I've provided a copy to the society and they can publish it. It's uh, We're not going to claim copyright on it. He starts out by giving biographical data, saying he was born in 1907, that he served in the Navy on aircraft carriers and destroyers, that he worked during the Second World War in an aircraft la in a laboratory in Philadelphia for research. He married Leslin McDonald, and he's still married to her at the time of this writing. He had not yet married Jenny. And he then went on for a page to tell about his all the people that had influenced him, the writers that had influenced him. And he said that he's publishing his first novel, it had been accepted for publication. And he wrote the title of the novel in the letter and then struck through it and put in Rocket Ship Galileo. So if anybody wants to find out the original title, they can look at the letter. Uh, and he also wrote the first story about Uranium-235 and he started publishing in the Saturday Evening Post, which was just unheard of for science fiction writers. And he said, I'm going to the letter now. I'm going to read a few excerpts from it because you should hear something from Heinlein, not from me. It's even possible that space flight in the ensuing golden age of interplanetary exploration, which will follow with certainty, and with speed, the first flight to the moon may prove to be the salvation of the human race. Another global war might well destroy us. Space flight opens at least a new frontier, a good thing in itself. New frontiers might ease the economic tensions, but I think there's another greater effect on us. Space travel could make all of us, white, black, yellow, and brown, aware of the rest of the universe and thereby aware that we're all sons of our planet. We may see the development of planetary patriotism, pride in the globe as 
concatenated with others. He then talks about the possibility of meeting other intelligent races in the solar system. They may seem strange and grotesque to us, but they will bring about a feeling of brotherhood in being terrestrials. It would be a sad and sardonic thing, though, if it took an interplanetary war to unite our planet. Now, how soon will this happen? Very soon. The experiments are now going on all over the globe. The problems remaining to be solved are only engineering problems, not basic science. The remaining principles we can sort out and we can predict with absolute certainty they will be solved. And quite a few people are already aware that there is the grimmest military necessity in solving the problems of space flight. For the nation that first conquers space has an unbeatable advantage in the atomic age. And he underlined that in the letter. Now, I don't want space flight for military reasons, and neither do you, but there it is. And the fact remains, it's sufficient to drive us to outer space, even if there were not pleasanter re reasons pulling us there. And then he talks about the economic potential of space and draws the conclusion that although the great wealth of the solar system will be available, that what will come from this is not yet known, but will be known. Mining, the economic reward of space travel cannot yet be guessed. I can't guess it. It's simply certain that it's there from past experience. Columbus sailed west for spices, and he brought back the Boulder Dam, Detroit, and the Empire State Building. Every great new adventure of the human race has produced totally unexpected new profits. The same inquisitive, questing, practical spirit that crossed the plains and conquered the air will turn up new wrinkles that make space flight pay. And I might mention that this transmission is coming to you through a Starlink medium orbit planetary communication system that couldn't have even been imagined when the letter was written. He then talks about the scientific needs, but that the real reason is curiosity. The long, long trail of the human race, our monkey curiosity, scientific zeal, boyish delight in the need to explore it stronger than hunger of the belly or of the loins. It brought us down out of the trees, made us experiment with fire, took us out over the frightening uncharted oceans and up into the stratosphere, and it not near, now calls us into the depths of space. And we'll go there with Galileo and Eric the Red and Columbus and Perry cheering us on, rooting for us. From the parched airless soil of the moon, we'll try the mists of Venus and then to the thin air of Mars and then out to the lonely night of Pluto someday, even to the stars. I don't expect to see it, but I'll be happy enough to see the headlines in the Herald Express radio contact with the first moon party. And I mentioned to you that this was written in 1947. Now, the Heinlein Trust was established by Virginia Heinlein because they had no children. He had uh, a medical problem in the Navy. He was medically dismissed from the Navy and they could not have children. But all of us are Heinlein's children and the libertarian concepts in Heinlein's writing permeate all of his writing. It's not just the ones that won these lovely awards with their golden coins. And if we can get those ideas out to the rest of the human race, which is what the trust is attempting to do, among other things, we will have done a good job. The trust has published three other books other than the 46 books of Heinlein. One of them is the primary reference on space solar power. One is the primary reference on space elevators. And the last one is the first and only comprehensive work that has been published so far on space mineral resources. We did this because it's clear that Heinlein would have wanted us to. And these are the things that will drive us into space. We're seeing it happen right now. So I'm immensely grateful to you for popularizing these ideas and we'll do anything I can to help you. Uh, 
appreciate very much being able to make remarks. I'm sorry, Mr. Heinlein couldn't be here to make them himself. All right, John, uh, welcome to the ceremony and let's hear from you. Yes, thank you. Um, good day to you all across the green hills of earth. It's my pleasure to provide a, a few additional remarks on this occasion of Robert Heinlein's short story, Free Men, being inducted into the Prometheus Awards Hall of Fame. I add my thanks to the Libertarian Future Society for this honor. Uh, why, am, why am I here talking right now? I've been a Heinlein fan since I was a preteen. I've been involved with the Heinlein Society since its inception in, in 2000 as a charter member and now a lifetime member. I've served on its board since 2012 and as its president since 2019. Our charity exists to pay it forward through continued good work supporting the literary legacy of Robert A. Heinlein and those causes he supported during his lifetime. We were created with the initial support and guidance of, of Mrs. Virginia Heinlein, Robert's widow. As an all volunteer organization, we depend on membership dues and donations to support our programs. Those programs include discussing the significance of his works to both existing fans and helping to create new fans and keep Heinlein's legacy alive. So free men is an interesting part of that legacy. Um, and, and Art, you couldn't have known it, but you picked the absolutely perfect letter uh, to provide sort of uh, background on Heinlein the Man from 1947, because um, Free Men was written after that first novel, Rocket Ship Galileo, around 1947, but it was not published until the collection, The Worlds of Robert A. Heinlein in 1966. In the introductory material to the story, when republished in the 1980 collection known as Expanded Universe, Heinlein makes it a point to say that it is supposed to represent any conquered nation in any century. The story is of the Barclay Free Company, a small collection of holdouts against a foreign invasion of the United States where nuclear bombs are readily used to keep the population in line. It is clear that this free company has men, women, children, and babies as its members. We meet the company captain, see how the company conducts itself, and how it deals with threats. There are some classic Heinlein elements in this short, reverence for Boy Scouts and the ability to make your way in the outdoors, using rules of order in a grassroots organization to conduct meetings and make decisions, the equal capability of women while still keeping to different gender roles. Pulling your own weight and fighting is what gives you the franchise in this company. The company must deal with a member, Joe, who isn't strong enough to stay hidden away. It's hinted twice he's not pulling his weight. He proves it by leaving. Most of the story tells of the consequences that ensue from Joe's defection, making sure the company as a whole stays safe until the day they can link up with the US provisional government and have unity from coast to coast. The key to the entire story is in just a couple of lines. And again, in serendipity, I'm gonna hearken you back to uh, Sarah's introductory remarks uh, um, for Dave. There's one thing this has taught me. You can enslave a free man. Only person can do that to a man is himself. No, sir, you can't enslave a free man. The most you can do is kill him. And a little later, don't you worry about him. A free man can take care of himself. In Jim Gifford's Robert A. Heinlein, A Reader's Companion, he notes that the story may have been completed from undeveloped story notes for The Stone Pillow, one of the future history stories that appeared as a title in Heinlein's famous future history timeline published in several revised versions. While not exactly the plot noted in Heinlein's archives, the timing and circumstances of The Stone Pillow could also fit free men. The 1950 version of the timeline indicates that the time frame for the stone pillow was set for the year 2025. On that sobering note, I'd like to point out that Heinlein made some interesting predictions in his lifetime, but he wasn't right about everything. It's not surprising to me that the, the LFS would choose to honor a story that very clearly restates core libertarian ideals as a part of its plot. I suspect that Mr. Heinlein would have been incredibly pleased that its message is still being honored some 76 years after he wrote it. Again, 
Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this day on behalf of the Highland Society and Mr. Highland himself. And once again, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Art. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody, for being with us. And congratulations, Dave, and congratulations, Rob. Congratulations. Well, thank you all very much. Um, as a guy who normally associates with maybe three people, I feel that this was, I've, I've been very nervous about this. And um, I appreciate your kindness and patience with it. And just to prove that I've got it. There you go. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, any last words? Uh, we Please look at the Libertarian Future Society website, lfs.org, and also the blog page for the Prometheus blog, uh, because we're going to be posting a video of this recorded acceptance uh, speech and, and ceremony, and we're going to be separately posting the uh, texts of all of the speeches, including the presenters and the acceptance speeches, with many photos that you haven't seen yet of Heinlein and Freer and um, other interesting okay. stuff. So stay posted to the Prometheus blog, which has a typical posting schedule of every three to five days. And with that, we're, we're very happy to have had you all here. Sure. Uh, fly, be free.